Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Yibane Beit Midrash. Welcome home to Torah. We're always using the clear, I shouldn't say we're always, we're almost always using the clear car for the basis of our discussion. And the Hebrew sheets are available. The source, the original source sheets are available on the webpage, and you'll find down below in the uh, YouTube description box a link where you could follow along in the Hebrew, which we highly recommend. <coughs> We are in, we are in Perik in uh, chapter thirty two of Numbers. We're in Matos, and next week in Chutzlar it's, it's a Matos Masse. It's a double parsha, but um, here we are, and we are going to discuss this concept. Just just know that there are two and a half tribes, and we're we're discussing the um, discussion of two of the tribes with Moshe where they want to choose to inherit what is called the eastern side of the Jordan River. They have a lot of livestock, and this land is quite um, plentiful when it comes to uh, food for the livestock. And uh, they, want, they want to inherit it, let's just say. At that point, there must be a misunderstanding. Moses is under the impression that perhaps they actually want to refrain from going to war with the rest of the tribes going into Israel. They clarify it and they say, no, we're actually just want to inherit it and we'll go and we'll fight and we'll come back. So just to get like a running start, if you look in the verses, I think it's um, in verse five, for example, where it says, if we have found favor in your eyes, let this land be given to your servants as a heritage. Therefore they want to, um, they want to have it as, a her as an inheritance. Do not bring us across, across the Jordan. That could be understood as not going to go to war. Moses responds in verse 6 and 7. Moses says to the children of Israel and the children of Ruvain, Shall your brothers go out to battle while you settle here? Why do you dissuade the heart of the children of Israel from crossing into the land that Hashem has given them? And then Moses says, Aren't you acting very similar to what the spies did? And look in Rashi on that. Why do, you, do you, why do you dissuade them? Why do you remove and hold back their heart from crossing? For they will be under the impression that you are afraid to cross because of the war, uh, because of the strength of the towns and the people. Um, so this is a very important thing, that there was a clarification. However, nevertheless, we're going to deal with some of the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts of their ta'ana, of their, a part of their claim, and to help us understand why they even had a claim to begin with. And so we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 32, and the, what the clear car will point out. Let me just explain. When we read this in English, you will have no clue, no clue whatsoever of what is bothering the clear car until you see the Hebrew. When you read the Hebrew, it should be glaring. It's like a neon light. Hopefully. So let's read the English for starters. In chapter 32, verse 1 of Numbers, the descendants of Reuven and Gad had an abundance of livestock, very numerous. That is how the verse is in English. And they saw this particular land, the land of Jazer and the land of Gilad, and behold, the place was a place for livestock. It was very um, green. It had a lot of food growing now look at, the, look at the Hebrew, okay? When you look at the Hebrew, you will understand what I mean that we'll call a description or an adjective is split between Reuven and Gad. And therefore, when we examine it carefully, you'll see that Reuven had one thing on his mind or a particular reason why they wanted to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan, and God had his own reason. Well, let's see. It says in Hebrew, Umikne rav haya livne Reuven. And we'll just pause for a second. That the livestock was a great amount. In other words, numerous. When it came to Ruvain, he considered what he had a lot. 
Whereas Ulivne Gad Atsuma od. What's the difference between Rav and Atsuma od? We're going to find out because Atsuma od can also mean plenty, right? It can mean numerous as well, but there's a little bit of a nuance that it actually is referring to strength and power. Okay, we'll find out. Now, that's the, going to be the very first words of the Kliyakar. As soon as we look on the source sheet where we quote the verse, Umikne Rav Haya Livne Ruvain, Ulivne Gad Atsuma Od, it says, Midolo Arvinu Hu Lomar, Umikne Rav Atsuma Od. He comes to a conclusion which I'll read in a second. He clearly says, from the very fact, that these two descriptions, Rav and Etzuma Od, are not intertwined, they're not connected. They're not mixed together as one statement like it could have said in Hebrew, <laughs> it seems like that's what it says in English, but if in the Hebrew it could have said the livestock was plentiful and strong, but it doesn't. It clearly says when it came to Ruvain, he considered what he had was Rav, and when it came to Bnei Gad, what he considered the description of his livestock was Atsuma Od, which we will translate for the time being as very powerful. So the Kliakar concludes, Shema Mina, from the very fact that it's not mixed together, that these descriptions are attributed to each one of these two tribes, Shema Mina, Shekol Echad Milsa Biape Nafshe, that each one, it infers clearly that each one is a matter on its own. Each description is referring to that specific tribe. Ki livnei Ruvain, when it came to the tribe of Ruvain, meaning the children of Ruvain, haya mikne rav ba mispar, there were a lot, at least in terms of quantity, uh, a great number. Ulivnei gad haya mikne atzum ba koach. I'm only reading the words. But we're going we're to find out what that description is. What does it mean, Atsum B'Koach? According to Bnei Gad, their description of what they had, or the Torah's description of what they had, was that they were enormous in power. Okay? Maybe, maybe not number, but at least in power. And the Kliakar brings down as proof that you could have flock, whether we're talking about goats or sheep, just flock in general, as uh, Atsum B'Koach, which means enormous in power, from a proof in Job. Look at number three on the English, English source sheet. Job, chapter 1, verse 10, <coughs> describes the, the Sutton wanting to test uh, Job and having a conversation with Hashem. Haven't you made a hedge, some kind of, a, let's say, a, a fence or s security uh, around him, his household, and all that he has on all sides. And what does he say? You have blessed the work of his hands. He obviously has a tremendous success. And his livestock has spread out in the land. That's a very interesting way to describe Job's success. Look in the Hebrew. When it says, Masa Yadav Beirachta, obviously the, the result, the produce of his hand you have blessed. Umiknehu Paratz. Paratz means to break forth, spread out, but it's a very strong word. Something <laughs> strong that's able to break through the land. Okay, so basically mm -hmm. I want to take you to the Talmud Bavli and Baba Batra, and we'll see this. Basically, I'll read the words of the Kliakar first. He's quoting the Gemara, She'izim shelo haya horagim ze'evim, that that Job's own sheep, or goats, in this case the goats, were actually killing the predators that came, I guess, that came to try to attack them. So let's look at number four in the English source sheet. The, the Gemara continues with its explanation of these verses. What does it mean in the verse we just quoted, and his livestock is paratz, increased in the land, or spread out in the land? Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina says, that the Job's livestock breached the order of the world. Now, I don't even know what that means, but I think the next statement clarifies. What does it mean? It breached the order of the world. It is the way of the world that wolves kill goats. That's usually how it works. 
But in the case of Job's livestock, it was the goats that killed the wolves. Mm -hmm. Now, so there is such a thing as atzumaod. You can have livestock that is usually timid and domestic and domicile, and yet be um, as ferocious as Job's were. So we can understand it's possible for Gad's as well. And then he brings another Gomorrah in Tainus, Kedemasik Batainus, like it's quoted in Tainus. He only gives us four words, which are really the end of the Gomorrah. Lacey Ize Dubeb Karnaihu, which means these, <laughs> these sheep came back with bears in their horns. But let's look at the Gomorrah. It's number five in the source sheet. Uh, Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa had some goats. Now his neighbors, maybe right, maybe wrong, but at least they spoke up and they suspected him of sending his goats onto their property and eating their, their fields. Now, it's forbidden, right? It's, if you own the goats, you have to make sure they only go into Hefker property and they don't go and steal from your neighbors. It's one of the reasons why it's really not proper to have a, um, to be shepherding in the land of Israel. But anyway, let's move on. He said to them, after they made this accusation that your goats are damaging our property, he said to them, like, an interesting idea. Listen, if I'm guilty, <laughs> my own goats should be destroyed by bears. But if I, my goats are innocent, meaning if I'm innocent, this claim is not a claim, then what we'll see as a result is my own goats will come back with bears between their horns and the Gemara concludes that's exactly what happened in the later that day that each one of these goats brought a bear impaled between its horns. So what I, I think the clear car is doing is building his argument that Gad's sheep, when it says Atsumaod, it's not such a foreign idea that there is such a concept that these um, domicile animals can certainly be vicious, or at sumaot. And that's what the Kleokar continues to say, Kachaya Livne God. This is the conclusion that Bnei God must have had Mikne Atzumaod, Bechayel Vekoach, very accomplished and powerful uh, animals. Al Kain, Bacharu Leishev Al Hasfar. Now, this is what the Kleokar is going to This is exactly the reason why they chose to be by, what's the Sfar? Sfar means the border. A border town or border. Border towns are usually very vulnerable to marauders or the enemy, but basically you're not in the center of civilization where you have protection of neighbors and whatnot. You're really on the edge. Frontier. The frontier, there you go. Now, they chose this for a reason, and not only that, then they would have no fear of their enemies. So there's two things. One is they didn't fear the enemy, and they didn't fear that marauders or stealers, or in this case, uh, wild animals and wolves, would try to steal or take their goats because their goats knew how to defend themselves. So there were two reasons why they didn't mind being in the frontier. Not afraid of the enemy and not afraid of wild animals. Kibatchu al kocham. Now I think this is very important because we're going to talk about who should you trust. So they trusted or they relied upon the might of these particular animals. Now, nothing wrong with that per se. In other words, we're asking why did they want to or desire we already said it's, it's a very luscious area for the goats. In fact, that's where the goats came from, that area. But more than that, um, they trusted them to be on the front line, so to speak. And with this, there is to learn a certain point of what we call dan lechav schut, to judging favorably. Ubizei yesh lumod ketzat schus See, later on, I mean later on meaning now, we're going to start reading these verses where they actually said that what we're going to do is we're going to build a shelter for the animals, and then we're going to build shelters or cities, let's say safe houses, for the children. 
Now, this also is a place of reason for Moses to be upset and to give them rebuke because Jews know, right? I mean, every human thinking human being should know this, that your children are your priority and your, uh, your physical wealth, which this was a, it's like, you know, the metatalin, it was not your, your real estate wealth, but it was your movable wealth. These, that's why the word um, for cattle and for, uh, let's just say, for livestock is meknehu, umikne, because it's, it's something you purchase. It's uh, movables. So the problem is we have to find something to justify why they did it. At the same time, what they did was deserving of rebuke. And let's go into verse 16. So you'll find this on the source sheet on number 6. What did they say? They approached him. So they approached Moses and they said, as I mentioned first, I mean, that's what they said first, which implied that that's what they're going to build first. We will build um, corrals or shelters, sheepfolds for our livestock here. And I'm just going to add the word secondly, (laughs) meaning at least in the order of their seeming, seeming priorities, they're going to build these cities or protection for their children. So this is a bit of a, a strange concept. Now let's just look at Rashi and you'll see, I'm not making this up. This is well known. Rashi says, when it says, we will build these sheepfolds for our livestock here, Moses was upset. They were more concerned about their possessions than about their sons and daughters. Now, it could be an assumption, and we will see that it is an assumption. Since they mentioned their livestock first, before mentioning their children, Moses does, yes, he does say to them, we'll see how, not so. That's not how to do it. You should treat the fundamental, or what's primary, what's most important as fundamental and primary and important, whereas whatever is secondary importance should be secondary importance. Don't construe, don't mix up the two. Rather, what Moses does say to them, we'll see in verse 24, is first build cities for your children, and only afterwards you then build shelter for your sheep. I mean, I'm just looking at number 24 now. Remember, we just read 16. In 24, is Moses saying to them, go ahead, so build cities for your children and enclosures for your sheep. Now, we will understand what it means at the end of this verse, because it doesn't make sense. And what has proceeded from your mouth shall you do? What does that mean? Wait, just hold your horses. Hold your horses. Here we go. Let's go back into the clear car. And we just got done saying there is a reason to look positively at what Reuben and Gad, the, two, you know, the, the tribes of Reuben and Gad, were saying about building first these, sh- the shelter for the animals and only afterwards the cities or the shelters for the children. Because they said, we already mentioned, Shesamuk l'gvul hasfar nivna t'chile gederos tzon Basically, they were saying, as close to the edge, as close to the border, that let us build first these shelter for these animals that are quite ferocious. And then later, within the land, meaning within the area that we're going to occupy, then let us build these shelters for our children. Yeshu Bituchim. Think about it. What were they saying? That basically, what benefit is there to build the corrals first? Because then when we finally have the children, they'll be in a safe place. Not like today what they call safe places, safe spaces, but a truly safe space away from the enemy or even from the wild animals. That they will dwell in, let's just say, security, Bituchim. In, in surety or security. She'im yavo ha'oidim, we're now on page two, that if the animals, the wild animals, oh, no, I'm sorry, ha'oidim, the, uh, the, the enemies, that if the enemies would come, what would we do? We would send our first response team, the kotat, the, the kitat konanut, right? Yavo tachila el gidros tzon. So, they, the enemy, here in the, in the case of the enemy, they would first attack 
the sheep that are in, the, in these corrals that are by the edge, and what would, it was like an alarm. You'd hear the, the chaos, you'd hear the moaning and groaning, who knows? Animals make noise. Ubeini baini, in the meantime, Yimaltu Hataf will be able to save the children. Vahamikne Shal Hasfar, and therefore by us leaving our animals corralled up by the edge of the camp or the edge of the border of the, <laughs> the border not, not far from the enemy, Enan Mityari Minhazaevim. We will have no fear. We don't fear even the Zeds. First of all, we're not going to fear the enemy, and we're certainly not going to fear the wolves. <laughs> Nevertheless, even though we tried to find some reason to don to judge them favorably, Moses did give them rebuke. He did. So im came, ein atem botchim Hashem. We said earlier on, they were relying on their what? On their sh- strong sheep or numerous sheep or both to protect them. And therefore, they were not relying on the salvations of Hashem. I'm just reading the words. Don't shoot the messenger. But rather, what did Moses, the rebuke of Moses in verse 24 he, he changes the order. He says, no, the first thing you should do is build these fortifications for your own children. Tehila, now he doesn't say fortifications. I shouldn't say that because we're going to see later on there's a difference between what they said. Remember we brought up the idea. Moses says, you do according to your own word. I'm kind of just giving you an advance notice. When they originally said, we're going to build cities, not fortified cities, we're going to build cities. And the following verse in 17, they said, we're going to build fortified cities. Moses is saying, no, go back to what you said originally, okay, about the non-fortified cities, and that will show that you really trust in Hashem. Okay, I'm sorry that I had to spoon feed you that, but I kind of slipped when I said fortified cities in verse 24, because that's not what Moses says. He says, He just says, build cities for your children. That's what Tehila Samach Gaspar, meaning start that close to the border. Don't worry. As if, ready? On the border, that's where your children, you're going to put your children on the border, and inside the center of the towns, you're going to put your animals. You're going to build these corrals for your animals. And then what will happen as a result? Va'acheichem kol beis Yisrael, all your brothers, ah, your, your, your Jewish brothers, what are they going to see? Yiru ki atem botim Hashem. They will actually see what great faith and uh, belief in the salvations of God. And through this, it's almost like Messias Nefesh, it sounds a little crazy, but through this you will actually fortify a certain amount of courage and um, strength in the heart of your brothers, that they will come to believe, all of them, in the salvation of God. And then he said, Hayotze mi pichem ta'asu, which threw us off, because we have no idea what he was talking about. And whatever came out of your mouth, you should do, because originally in verse 16, they did say, va'arim letapenu, just stam cities, mashma'arim koldehu, just regular cities without walls. And later on in verse 17, it sounds like they retracted or somehow they changed their mind from just regular unwalled cities to Arim, I'm sorry, the Yoshav Tapenu Biare Hamivtsar, which means that our children will reside in fortified cities. See, the very fact they're fortified. And Moses is saying, no, go back. It's better to have these unfortified cities. I just want you to know another idea. When, we, when, we spent, when Moses sent the spies into the land of Israel, he asked them a bunch of questions beforehand. He wanted to know, are these fortified cities or not? And it wasn't a trick question, but there was deep knowledge that if you're going to attack and they're very fortified, that's a sign that they're actually weak. I mean, we would think, 
right, at first glance, oh my God, a fortified city, there's no way we can conquer them because they're so fortified. But it's the weak people that build the fences around themselves, whereas the strong or courageous or well, maybe they're crazy, uh, will live in a city without any walls because they have belief in their own, you know, Krav Maga, if it ever came to it, we can take care of it, right? They have a certain sense of strength or they believe, you know, it could be uh, misguided. Confidence. But they have a certain confidence and, and therefore a certain strength that they don't need these walls. So if you have unwalled cities, they're actually harder to fight and harder to penetrate than the walled cities. So you get the idea here, it's, it's consistent with the idea here that Moses would have them rather feel the strength in the Chuas of Hashem of the salvation of God and not in the, the salvations of the wall. Although, look, we're, we're on the level we're on, right? It doesn't make sense to us, correct? It's, it's very hard for us to grasp this. But when you're living with miracles for all the times they did, even though they're coming to the land, but there is a, a tremendous amount of faith that one should have, and Moses is teaching them on his last, you know, he's about to, uh, he was about to start Deuteronomy, so we know that uh, there's not much time for his life. He wants to teach us, because he's Moshe Rabbeinu, as much Torah, as much faith about God as he possibly can. And this is his, the Tochachav Moshe, al Cain. Oh, I skipped something? I did skip something. After we read this verse, 17, where it says, build, right, we're going we're gonna to live in these cities and build these fortified cities for, for, fortified cities for our children, it's mashma shechashvu lehisagev bechoizek ha'arim, that they thought to build very strong, exalted cities, v'yaviyu moirek belev hanashim. But unfortunately, if they did that, that would actually bring... Um, a actual weakness that would actually bring a I'm not going to I don't know if cowardliness is the word but it's a weakness it's a breakdown of the morale that's the point that's why Moses gave them this rebuke and he said in verse 24 his words to them was go build those cities not fortified cities uh, and what, come, what came out of your mouth uh, you should do because you originally said in verse 16 we're going to build cities not fortified we're just going to build cities for our children ok so in, in number 10 the Midrash Tan Choma I just want to emphasize I'll read the whole thing but I want to say this is the main point where it says about five lines up from the bottom you loved your money more than your souls by your souls, you, there's no blessing in this. Now, what does that mean? It's based on a Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21, that an estate that is acquired in haste, which the clear car is telling us, this is, or I should say the clear car, the Medrash is telling us, this is referring to the two tribes, two and a half tribes, that wanted to acquire quite quickly this, um, this inheritance. And an estate acquired in haste at its offset, outset, meaning at first, which we'll see in the Hebrew, will not be blessed in the end. So we'll see in the Hebrew, in number 11, Nachala mevohelet berishona, if an acquisition, right, is acquired too hastily, Viacharita at the end, at its end, lo tivorach, it will not be blessed. Listen, it's very important. Let's start at the beginning of number 10. We said, and there was rove, right? There was a lot of cattle, a lot of um, livestock. And this is what it means in Ecclesiastes. A wise man's heart is to his right. This is referring to Moshe. But a fool's heart is to his left. This is referring to the children of Reuben and God. Foolish. What did they do? Exactly what we saw in Rashi. They made what was essential or fundamental, <laughs> tafel or secondary, and that which was ikar or tafel, right? They switched them both. Why? Why would someone make such a mistake of what's important as secondary and what is secondary is important? Because they love their possessions more than them, um, themselves. I'm sorry, more than their selves. More than their selves. 
And they said to Moses, we saw in verse 16, we're going to build our, our um, shelter for the flocks first. And afterwards, meaning secondary, that for the towns for our children. Moses says, no, you're doing it all wrong. Don't do like this. What you need to do, we saw in verse 24, is first build your towns for your children. And afterwards, then you build a shelter for your flocks. So we see from here what we said originally in Ecclesiastes 10.2, that a wise, man heart, a wise man's heart is to his right. This is Moshe. But a fool's heart is to his left. This is the children of Ruvain and the children of God. What was God saying? Now this is the verse I quoted. This is this concept I quoted. You loved your money more than your souls. By your lives there's no blessing. So we quoted the verse, an estate acquired in haste at the outset will not be blessed in the end. And there's also in Proverbs 23, 4, do not toil to gain wealth. You're trying to gain wealth, don't run so fast, but rather have the sense to desist. Slow down. Now who is wealthy? We all know. One who is happy with his lot. Okay, and there's a state in Psalms 128.2. You shall eat the produce of your hands and you'll be happy. In other words, when you work for something, it's not a, an undeserved gift. When you work for that money, it, it's more valuable. Okay, and you will be blessed. So don't be so hasty. Now, the main point is going to be, now there's a very interesting Rashi on, on Mishle, Kaf, Kaf Aleph, uh, 2021, where we just read about this idea of an inheritance may be acquired hastily in the beginning, but its end will not be blessed. Rashi says, with, on this verse, which one hastened to take hurriedly? Like who? We see that the sons of God and the sons of Reuben, they wanted to quickly take their share on the other side of the Jordan. And they spoke hastily. They, they spoke up in verse 16. Right? We want our... Are, we want to build these, um, these shelters for the sheep and the cattle, and we'll then build the cities for our children. What they did is they made the main thing of secondary import, for they placed their flocks before the children. What happened at the end? Drum roll, please. What happened at the end? I mean, this is like a sad ending. They were not blessed. Who were the first of the 12 tribes to go out into exile? So that's why we're going to quote 1 Chronicles chapter 5.26. Uh, but before we get there, it says like this, For they were exiled many years before the rest of the tribes, as is expressed in Seder Olam, chapter 22, as well as the Midrash of uh, Rabbi Tanchuma. Um, in the second year of Ahaz, the Lord aroused the desire of the king of Assyria, the rod of Hashem, and took out those two and a half tribes. But the rest of the tribes were only exiled in the sixth year of Hezekiah, which is in the ninth year of Hoshea, the son of Ella. Okay, as clear as day, look at First Chronicles chapter 5, 26. It says, And the Lord inspired Pul, the king of Assyria, and Telegath, Pelneser, the king of Assyria, and they exiled the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, Okay, so they were the first to go. So in the, back to that concept in Mishle, was it in Proverbs, that an estate acquired in haste in the beginning, which is what happened, in the, uh, in the end, will not be blessed. And that's not a blessing to be exiled. So let's go back into the clear car and continue this thought where all we read was the verse in Mishle. So, two lines down in that paragraph. Since they took their inheritance first. Therefore, whatever comes later, their end, was not blessed. They were the first to be exiled. As we just read in... Divrei Yamim Chronicles chapter 5 verse 26. The Yaglem Leruvene Uligadi. Now, it's interesting when you look at the verse, right? Nachla Mvohelit Birishona, and then there's a Vav, 
the acherita. The English we said, but your end will not be blessed. Either way, what do you mean end? Either way, what is the end? What is the vav doing there? So he's tried to explain it. vav shel Now, in order to explain or justify or resolve any issue with that one letter vav, which seems out of place, nira shikach perusho, that this is what it means, according to the the rabbis. We already said, The problem was they put their children before their, sorry, they put their, their um, livestock before the children. Regarding this, that's what this verse is referring to. Again, what is your inheritance? Higdimo nachlatam hainu mikne, meaning the acquisitions, which we call the flock. These are the movables. Lahaskiram rishona, as they did mention first. Therefore, and as is mentioned first as well, al came gam acheritam. Therefore, you're going to lose also the end. Hainu ataf shacharav. You're going to end up losing your children who come after you. Lo tivorach. There will not be a blessing on them. Kigam hagufos gam nachalatam hakol kolu baashan kolu. That even their bodies, right, especially or even their bodies also is considered your inheritance. All of it, everything is basically we call total loss going up in smoke. Vaiker im hatafel, that both what you consider the iker as well as the tafel, <coughs> whatever was fundamental. And whatever was secondary, all of it is going to be lost. Kulam halachu shevi lifnei rodef. All of them are going to be captured by the pursuer, unfortunately. Well, there's a lot of lessons we should be learning from this about how we view wealth. So now we're going to read only the next paragraph. We're not going to continue, but I will give you a summary at the end of what the Klikar will be discussing after this. So now we're actually in verse 2. And verse 2 you'll find on number 13. Now, I don't know if you'll understand it from the English, but certainly the way the Klikar will explain it, it will become obvious. It says, the descendants of Gad and the descendants of Reuven came, and they approached Moses and to Eleazar and to the uh, leaders of the community, saying, okay, that's whatever it is that we discussed already, that they wanted to inherit this part of the land. Why is, ready? Why is, nobody knows what I'm about to say, why is God mentioned first? Gad mentioned first. He's not the firstborn. Ruvain is the older, and you would have expected, you would have expected that you're confronting Moshe, or you're asking for an inheritance, especially, right? that Reuven should have come forward first. I mean, we don't know what happened other than the narration tells us first it mentions Gad and then it mentions Reuven for a reason. We don't know the reason, but we have to ask, wouldn't it have made more sense that Reuven would have been mentioned first because he's the firstborn? Viteda, so the Kleokar wants us to know, Kimaforshim Amru. Now, there are other commentators that say a little bit different than what the Kleokar said so far up to this point. Shemikne b'nei Gad haya maruba shel al shel ruvain. We don't know who these Meforshim are. They're not quoted, other than there are opinions that b'nei Gad actually had much more in number uh, of cattle and sheep and whatnot, of livestock, than b'nei Ruvain did. We said earlier that it was a tsumma'od, which meant quant quality, not quantity. That Ruvain had a greater quantity, and Gad had a greater quality. However, there are Meforshim that say, actually, Gad had even more than Ruvain did. Hainu dixiv, because of the statement, Ubnei Gad a tsumma'od. And what kind of livestock did B'nai God have, they had a very powerful mass. Okay, meaning to say, according to the Kliakar, the way he understood these other Meforshim, that the, that the uh, Yotir Mishal Ruvain, 
that they had many more numerous than Reuven did. Al can Amru B'nai Gad. And that's, according to these other Meforshim, why the B'nai Gad spoke first before the children of Reuven, who should have been first. And now, according to them, this is all the clear car explaining these other Meforshim who want to say that it was because B'nai Gad had more Lefisha Hayat Saran Gadol Al Shal Ruvain. Therefore, right, the more wealth you have, the more pain you have if you don't get what you want. And therefore, the pain of Gad was greater because they needed these lands to pasture their flock. And therefore, they spoke up first. Now, this is all according to the way the clear car is under, understanding the other opinion. However, you know that he doesn't agree necessarily with their opinion, but he's going to disagree even within their opinion. In other words, not only do I hold that they were at Tzum Ma'od in strength, but your opinion that they felt greater pain, I don't agree with. There's a different reason why Gad spoke up first. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to discuss this. Va'aniyomer. I'm going to tell you why Gad spoke up first. Why the B'nai Gad spoke up first. Va'adai lo b'nai tzaran kafzu barosh. Not because of any pain that a wealthy person here, in this case, may feel. Ki imitok rum levovam kafzu ledaber barosh. It's because of arrogance, a character trait that is not good. Okay? The word rum levovam, haughtiness and arrogance. That's why they jumped before the heads of B'nai Ruvein HaBachor, who was the firstborn. Kikach teva ha'oysher. So none of us understand this because none of us are that wealthy. We haven't been tested. But apparently, it's a big test. Right? Bring it on. Bring on the test, right? And that's what he says. Kikach teva oysher. Shenotem rum lev labalav. That it's the nature of the wealth or perhaps, right, the nature of having this wealth that could allow or establish such a, a, a character trait as haughtiness to the one who owns all this wealth. The Osher Hediot, now an Osher Hediot means someone who's probably not working on their character. A regular wealthy guy, he's Koifitz Barosh, the ane azut. He jumps to the front. You know how often have you been where you've seen? I don't know. You know, where it's the bank, whatever. Maybe at a, a gala, the wealthy they just walk straight in, right? They jump to the front of the line, right? They think they have. They think they're God's gift to the world, and why wouldn't they? God gifted them with such wealth, right? So this is where the arrogance seems to seems to stem from. Listen to the words he says. The usher hediot koifetz barosh, the ane azus with such bold and brazenness, lo yashuv mipneko. He doesn't bow down for anybody. He doesn't sit for anybody. He doesn't respect anybody. Eno choyle kavod libachor, and therefore he would not give the respect that should be coming to the firstborn, lo shum ba'ale amala amitit, which is not the way someone who's really worked on their character would do. Bechashvu ki al yedei oisher hu mit romain, that they consider that it's because of the wealth, it's through the wealth. I'm obviously very gifted. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm at the top of the... You know, the pyramid, I'm the 1%, right? I'm the top of the food chain, whatever it is. Now, the clear car, honestly, the clear car goes on for at least two full pages and goes through some really deep things. But what I want to kind of do is sum up at least certain points. I'm not doing it any justice. But if you look on page five, there's this whole idea of number 16, for example. Actually, I might as well deal with number verse 7. It's 75 7 in Psalms, in number 15. This is, for it's not from the east nor from the west, nor from the desert does elevation come. 
The truth is, this is like a hint to the idea, not from the east side of the Jordan, not from the west side of the Jordan, and obviously certainly not from the desert. You, you know where the elevation is going to come from? Don't look to this world. Don't look to be the greatest businessman. That's not where your wealth is going to come. Right? You, I know plenty of people, they put in the work, in the business, and they're not as rich as some of these people who don't put any work in. Right? It's just, it's mind-boggling how the world actually works. But this verse is saying, don't rely on your physical, necessarily, efforts, whether it's from the east or from the west. Um, but rather, as the following verse says, but it comes from God, basically. God judges. He humbles this one and elevates that one. Just keep this in mind for one second, that where did they get this great amount of wealth? The Torah actually tells us they got it from the Midianites. Why does the Torah even have to tell us that? If God so desires, he wants to make someone rich, why does he have to take it away from one and give it to another? Let him just snap his fingers, blink his eyes, go huff and puff, and bang, the guy's wealthy. It seems like he's taking it from one and giving it to another. And there's a reason for this. There's a reason for this. Look in just Isaiah number 40. Actually, I want to, you know what? Go into Rashi on 75.8, where it says he humbles this one and elevates that one. He, the elevated one he lowers, and the lower, lowly, he elevates. It's up to him. Okay? And then in verse, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4, every valley should be raised. The valley is that low place, and it's going to be raised. And every mountain, which is the high place, and every hill shall be lowered. Again, Hashem is not just making wealth out of the blue, but He's, uh, I think they say in today's society, there's a transfer of wealth, mm -hmm. right? So the transfer of wealth, what does it prove? That there's a judge, that there's a God. In the sense that one should behave properly, not perversely. In other words, it's supposed to set a, a certain fear or awe or sense of reality in that rich person. I just got rich, but that guy was rich and look at him, now he's dirt poor. That could be me tomorrow or the next day. I mean, it sets a certain sense of reality because that's ultimately God wants you to be responsible for your behavior and not act like you're God's gift to the world. I got this and I don't care and I'll step on whoever I want. That's not the way. Um, there, even when we talked about chapter 75 in Psalms, even verse 5 and 6, I said to the perverse, do not behave perversely. And to the wicked, do not raise your horn. This is the idea. Do not raise your horn on high. Do not speak with your fat neck. Going back to our chapter in Numbers 32.19, because they, like, you know what? This is already beyond us. This would be a great way to place to stop. The clear car goes on for two and a half pages, describing how we need to deal with wealth, how we need to deal with our character, and not be arrogant, okay? And this was his premise, his thesis, for the reason that Gad stuck his neck out, so to speak, and spoke up because of arrogance. So hopefully, I mean, we know that you're not allowed to pass in front of me a Rebbe, there's certain things. I mean, we have to work on our character and give honor and credit to those it's due. Um, I will say, go to, if you're interested, I gave a shear on the 48 ways, not just a shear. 50 episodes, or 51 episodes, okay? I'll put the link down below as well. You want to acquire Torah? It's all about Derech Eretz. It's about working on your character. And Gad, unfortunately, seems to have made a, a, a I say Gad himself, we're talking about B'nai Gad, right? Has seemed to have made a grave mistake by stepping forward. It was a sense of arrogance. And hopefully we can all learn to trust in Hashem and work on our character and uh, learn some very, very valuable lessons. Imir Tashem, Bezrat Hashem. At some point in the future, I will try to give a shear on those two and a half pages because it's definitely at least an hour's worth of material, minimally. Um, so that would be a shear on, it, on its own. Anyway, so I want to wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom, a Chodesh Tov, Mamash, Menachem Av. We should see some real uh, consolation. Uh, this coming month, and a Shabbat Shalom. Kol Tuf. Have a great life.
Yes, I'm not sure.